guy who's made racing pay off with his business investments. But at the California hospital, children suffering from hemophilia see him as a man who plays Santa Claus in summertime. A man who will stand on his head to make them smile. These are some of the many sides of Billy Harmatz. This is his story, the story of a jockey. John Willis. And this is the world of racing. Empty now, but in a few hours the fans will begin to pour in and it'll become a world of crackling excitement with nervous thoroughbreds and little men with big shoulders like Billy Harmatz who ride to win. Number nine, a heavy favorite, is a working jockey. He rides an average of five races a day, six days a week, 50 weeks a year. But even when a jock is on a heavy favorite, there are upsets. That's what makes horse racing. When I lose a race, I feel bad. When the horse is six to five of the favorite, and especially if I lose a race by a nose or a photo, which I feel very badly, because I feel that maybe if I'd have did something a little different that I might have possibly won the race. But I believe a rider always feels bad when he gets beat out of favor. When people start booing me and screaming at me, and if the horse doesn't get beaten, they bet their money. Well, I feel sorry for him. I feel bad about it. But by smiling back at him, it kind of cuts it. If I get mad, they'd love it. And by laughing at him, they, what can they say? I just smile at him, give him that old smile, and keep on walking. <laughs> Where's your mommy? Connie. Hi. Hi, dear. How are you? Okay. How'd you do? Oh, pretty good day. We've been two dating since one. Jake just got up to get the money. Good. Let me write that in the ledger. You want to take him to the bedroom? Many of Jack's make the mistakes of shutting their wives out of their riding careers. Actually, I've went out of my way to make Connie feel that she's just an important part of this show as I am. And it's worked out wonderful for both of us. This ledger that Connie's writing in here is my whole history of racing. She's put down everything that I've ever written in this book here and all the stakes that I've collected. In the beginning, I just wanted to last long enough in racing so that Connie and I could buy our little gas station. We start by just wanting to be around horses. We to do all the dirty work just to be around them. I started riding at the fair circuit. You have bad horses, you got riders that just ride during the summer and can't make it any place else. And uh, this is the greatest experience you can have is just riding a lot of races to get the experience because you can't get it sitting in a jock room. I'd ride six days a week at the fair, and Sundays I'd fly across the border to Mexico and ride about 12 races a day there. Well, if they had four legs, even three legs, I didn't care, just as long as they had hair on them. I'd ride them, as long as that man paid that 20. Billy finished his apprenticeship and graduated from the fairgrounds to the Big Apple, the major race tracks. Santa Anita, Saratoga, Belmont, Churchill Downs. And he started getting better horses. In 1959, at Pimlico in Maryland, riding Royal Orbit, he won one of racing's greatest stakes, the $100,000 added Preakness. And Connie added to the ledger what Billy got for a two-minute ride, the jockey's 10% share of a winning purse. In this case, $13,570. Now, Billy Harmatz was big business. first started in, in real estate and uh, my other enterprises, it didn't uh, start out to, to be something as big as it's grown. But actually, the main reason I started riding was for security. 
and not only for security for myself and wife, but uh, for my children as we kept adding to the family. And I realized you couldn't gain the security by just riding alone. Because every time you go out on a racetrack, you've taken a chance of falling on your head or hurting yourself to the point where you can't ride anymore. Six days a week, Billy Harmatz races for a living. Sundays, he spends with his family. But somehow it always ends up as a busman's holiday, back around horses. This is Thoroughbred Paradise, a ranch in which Billy is a partner, a place his kids love. All the Harmatzes take naturally to the saddle. Thoroughbred Paradise is sort of a milk farm for tired out racehorses where thoroughbreds are freshened up to return to the track. Here, foals are weaned, and most important, yearlings are broken to the saddle. loves to be around horses, late in the day and early in the morning. As a working jock, his day begins at 5 a.m. in the stable area behind the backstretch. The racetrack comes alive at dawn. I've always been a morning jock. And when I say a morning jock is that I've always been a jock that had to get up in the morning and uh, kind of hustle for myself and get on a lot of horses in the morning. There are some riders that don't have to do this, like a shoemaker or knees. But to me, this is a part of the racetrack that I feel real close to and, and that I love and that I feel it's part of racing. The, the glamour and really the, what I'd call racetrack life is the morning, getting up in the morning and feel like you're part of it. Billy's trademark around the stables is a Shetland pony. He uses it to get around the miles of stable area. Stormy is better than a bicycle. Early in the morning, Billy Harmatz checks with his agent, Bill O'Leary. Well, jockey needs an agent, same as an actor needs an agent in the movies. A sharp agent will know just what horses will go into each race, and he'll try and get on one of the liver mounts. On his rounds, O'Leary speaks to Farrell Jones, a trainer who needs Billy for a certain horse, a horse with a problem. Billy likes this kind of challenge and agrees to talk to Farrell about the horse. Uh, Miss Implant, this is Billy Harman. How do you do, Billy? Bill, we've got a horse here that's got a bad throat condition, and. We're, we're about to give up on him. We uh, had the operation performed, and uh, we decided we'd like to have you breeze him a couple of times, and uh, we'll go see the movie and find out your idea on him. I'm fine, Phil. When do you want me to get on this horse? Well, uh, this morning, if you could. All right, well, I've got one to go, and I'll be back in about 10 minutes. How will that be? Good, Bill. Okay, Good. fine. Thank you. Bunny McLeod's horse is named Delph Blue. By breeding, by training, by all the standard guides of thoroughbred racing, he should be a winner. But this four-year-old bay horse, who looks so good on paper, never lives up to his promise on the racing strip. Bunny McLeod will give him just one more chance. Billy, uh, take this horse in the gap. Then jog about an eighth of a mile. Gap him around about the six and a half furlong. So we'll pull him up and let him walk around and get a little air. Uh, I break him to three-quarter pole, let him go three-quarters mile about 15. Go the first five-eighths mile about two, and then maybe the last eighth mile move on him a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Oh, 
Okay, where's it? Come on, Riley. Well, I've ridden for Mrs. McLeod before. You know, to her, every horse is just like her very own. And uh, it takes a real personal interest as she has no family of her own. I don't believe any children. And uh, it kind of reflects that each one of these horses are just like one of her own little kids. Under Farrell's instructions, Billy takes Delph Blue through a morning workout. As I worked the horse out, I could tell he was really fast, but he had this wind problem. He'd get away fast and be right up there, reaching for the money. And then he'd just sort of run out of gas, as if there was just no more fuel left or someone turned ignition off. I decided to talk to Farrell about it. A horse with a problem. In three days, Billy will ride Delft Blue in a race at Bay Meadows. And if he doesn't win, Delft Blue's career in racing may be over. Bay Meadows Racetrack, a crisp and clear Saturday. Today, Billy Harmatz is slated to ride Delft Blue in the sixth race. In the jockey's room, all the racing silks of the individual owners are hung on the ceiling. Louis Pederudo has been up early taking them down. There are eight races this day, and that means 80 or more jockey uniforms to be lined on racks. One rack for every race. Before each race, the jockey will pick the silks, matching his position in the race. Each jockey has his own personal valet to tend to his silks and his leather to help him make the changes fast between races. And they come, the smallest of all athletes, many of whom make over $100,000 a year because they're small enough and light enough to ride thoroughbreds. Last night's dinner is sweated out in the steam room. A jockey's ideal weight is between 105 and 108 pounds. An extra pound can mean losing a mount. In the photo patrol room, jockeys can watch the movies of past races. It gives Farrell Jones and Billy a chance to analyze Delft Blue's last performance. See, Bill, uh, at this particular point, every time the horse runs, he stops. Mm -hmm. He's about four in front there, see? Well, it could be that the rider taking too much hold him and bending his neck and uh, choking him. You know, Farrell, maybe these jocks have been making a mistake with this horse, letting him run till he runs out of gas. Maybe if it had kind of pulled him back a little the first part, he'd have enough wind to finish the last. I think you've got a good idea then, Bill. Long before the racing starts, the fans are on their way to the track. They've come early to play the Daily Double and have time to handicap the winners. But the touts are all ready to save them the trouble. are filled with that one o'clock optimism, itching for easy money. But to some, like owner Bunny McLeod, it's not just a matter of money. Billy has bounced in the third, fourth, sixth, and seventh races today. With the other jockeys, he finds ways to wait out the time between races. Finishes out of the money in the third and fourth races. His next bout is Delft Blue. Now it's time for the sixth race. The ritual of the race begins. Delft Blue is brought out with the rest of the entries. Farrell Jones leaves for the panic. The odds, the morning line on Delft Blue, number 11, are 10 to 1.
goes on to win place show. Prompted by hunches, charts, names, numbers, or maybe by sticking a pin into the program. collected here. The odds change here. In the jockey room, Billy gets ready for the sixth race. The owner's silks are not tailored to the individual jockey, so Billy must string rubber bands around his wrists to adjust the sleeves. A steel helmet goes under his cap in case he takes a spill. equipment is four pounds lighter than the weight Delf Blue has been assigned. Lead bars are added to his saddle to make up the difference. The different weight handicaps balance the chances of all the horses in the race. The better the horse's record, the more weight he must carry. The strips of lead are put inside the saddle. valet leaves for the paddock to saddle up Delft Blue. This is the last stop for the skittish thoroughbreds before the race. Each horse is checked by photo to guard against a possible ringer. And as a double check, the tattoo on each horse's lip is inspected. This is Delft Blue's riding habit. Saddle, halter, and blinker. Number 11 is ready. Too high strung to stand still, the thoroughbreds are walked, and the betters get a chance to look them over. The jockeys wait for the final call. Side and back. When you come out of there, you better get right into it because you might try to go through the outside fence or something. I, I think this uh, number two or number four thing, now Horace got the most speed. Uh, if you could not run her, well, I'd try to lay along second. If you could, could go to the front, I think you'd probably be better off on the lead, and I'd kind of keep after him all the way because he might duck or pop or anything. I'm fine. Well, you want to warm up a little, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring you out down about three or four, Bill. Okay, fine. Good luck. All right, thank you. Go that way, Alberta. in front of the grandstand, held in check by a lead pony. The gallop to the starting gate gives Delft Blue a chance to warm up. Only a few minutes to post time. The racing form gets ready to send out the results of the race to the news agencies across the country. High in the grandstand, the stewards, the racing judges, watch for any infractions of the rules. 
Racing fouls will be caught by the telescopic lens of the camera. And jockeys who are not riding watch the race from the roof of the jockey room. Professionals who will judge what will happen in the next few minutes. Official starter hides the switch that will trigger the opening of the gates. Keeps it out of the jockey's sight so they can't anticipate the start of the race. jockey's room. And that's how Billy likes it. When he comes back a winner, the man always walks like he's ten feet tall. We'll be back in just a moment with the story of a jockey. coming up, and Billy Harmatz changes soaks for another ride. In 20 minutes, he'll be balanced precariously on the back of a flying thoroughbred, controlling 3,000 pounds of highly trained energy. That's his day. That's his work. That's his life. And Billy Harmatz, a working jockey, wouldn't have it any other way. 